Well, good morning. Uh, this is Dr. David Hill. I'm a professor of medical sciences at the Frank H. Netter, MD, School of Medicine at Quinnipiac University. I have trained in an internal medicine and infectious diseases. And at Quinnipiac, I helped develop and run the programs in global public health. So this morning, I'd like to talk to you for the next 45 minutes or so about COVID-19 and put it in perspective to other pandemics and other coronaviruses. So my goal over this period of time is to review the concept of emerging and zoonotic infections, to discuss policies to respond to global health events, to highlight the last global pandemic, which was in 2009, swine flu, or known as H1N1 influenza, present the spectrum of illness with coronaviruses, compare SARS and MERS with COVID-19, what lessons can we learn from those, analyze the transmission dynamics and illness with COVID-19, and then present methods to contain and mitigate uh, the disease. So I think the question always comes up with pandemics and new infectious diseases, are we ready? And we as a country, we as a global community need to analyze where we've been successful in, the, in dealing with this and where we haven't, and apply those lessons now and prepare for the future events as well. So let's look at the concept of emerging infections. There are several diseases which have been called newly emerging, i.e. they weren't recognized uh, several years or decades ago and now are. Diseases such as HIV, shigatoxin producing E. coli, which have been seen in uh, outbreaks of uh, severe diarrhea. Avian and swine influenza A, there are several types of those, SARS, MERS, Ebola, and Zika are some examples. Those that are re-emerging, these are diseases that have been around for many, many years, centuries perhaps, uh, dengue, chikungunya, tuberculosis, particularly multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, West Nile encephalitis, so diseases that have uh, been, uh, been occurring but have re-emerged, they have increased their prevalence. And then we worry about uh, emerging infectious diseases that can be used as bioterrorism agents, and one of the uh, examples of that is anthrax. So many emerging infectious diseases are also zoonoses. So these are animal infections. Generally, uh, for many of these, the animal remains well. And something happens that this zoonotic disease, this disease that is typically in animals, transmits to humans. Humans may go into the territory, such as logging in uh, rainforests and exposure to diseases such as yellow fever. So humans come into contact with these, and then they become ill. So we have lots of infectious diseases that are in the animal kingdom. And they can pass, if we use the example of influenza viruses, from wild waterfowl to domestic uh, poultry. So that would be the typical chain. There they get amplified, and then they transmit into humans when humans come in contact with the domestic poultry. So a reservoir of influenza viruses in wild waterfowl transmitting to domestic poultry and then passing to humans when humans come into contact. Sometimes uh, the diseases need to pass uh, from animals to humans via a vector. So a vector, we would think of the insects such as uh, ticks and fleas and mosquitoes. So that's how it gets into the human population. So we're considering emerging infections or zoonotic infections. We need to take into account the pathogens, i.e. the viruses and bacteria, uh, that we're, we're discussing, uh, the vectors sometimes that are bringing them from that animal host to humans. We need to think about the animals that are carrying these uh, organisms. And then we focus on uh, human, pop human populations, which is both individuals and populations. So one of the challenges we have with respiratory infections, respiratory emerging infections, 
is that we have a very mobile society and you can be in one part of the globe and 24 hours be across the globe uh, and, and carry that particular pathogen. So we've seen uh, that the spread of influenza viruses, the spread of coronaviruses, the spread of other diseases can occur very rapidly due to this uh, mobile uh, population that we have. And if we look at how many individuals are traveling uh, across international borders, this looks at interna international tourist arrivals, 1995 through 2018. We can see in 2018, we had 1.44 billion people crossing international borders. That's a tremendous number. That's increased from half a billion uh, two and a half decades ago. You can see that there was a leveling off post 9-11, the terrorism attacks, and then a leveling off uh, with the recession of 2008, and certainly we'll have a leveling off uh, uh, following this uh, current outbreak of COVID-19. So the global community has developed a way to deal with these uh, emerging infections, these rapidly uh, progressing infections across the world, and that is the international health regulations. They were first uh, started uh, post-World War II to deal with diseases such as uh, cholera, and then they were revised. The most recent uh, revision was in 2005, prompted in part by the uh, SARS outbreak of 2002-2003. So this is a unique framework for containment of global public health risks. And the concept behind the international health regulations is to improve our ability to detect pathogens. And now with uh, molecular detection methods, we are much more, uh, much more able to uh, do this. We can uh, test for more pathogens, and we can do this more rapidly. Not only should we detect that, but we should assess the threat. So we may detect a new pathogen, but does that mean anything? So let's assess the implications for that for our human and animal populations. And then we need a mechanism to report it. So we want to report it not only to local health departments or regional or national health departments, but should it be escalated up to uh, international health uh, bodies such as the CDC and the WHO? and then to respond. So it's not enough to detect um, this, to assess its threat, to report it, but we have to deal with the consequences of that. So we want to build our capacity to identify and our capacity to respond to these outbreaks. And it's not just infectious diseases. Uh, we're thinking about uh, biological threats, uh, chemical threats, and radionuclear threats. So with the meltdown of the nuclear reactor in uh, in Japan some years ago, that was also something that fell under uh, international health regulations. And we want to shift from borders to the source. So rather than screening or preventing travelers coming in at borders, in general, we want to identify the source of this and deal with it at the source, uh, which is a much more efficient way uh, to deal with the emerging pathogen. And the ideal would be to do this with a minimal disruption to travel and trade. Uh, we can see with the current COVID-19 uh, outbreak, that's difficult to do. We certainly have disrupted travel and trade. But we need to have commerce continue. If you think about the needs for uh, intensive care unit uh, technology and respirators for individuals who have uh, respiratory failure, uh, we need to be able to produce those and ship those around the world uh, where they're needed. So if we come back to infectious diseases under international health regulations, a single case of smallpox, polio, SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, the first uh, uh, outbreak that was documented around coronaviruses, influenza pathogens with pandemic potential, single cases of these get notified to the WHO. For other infectious diseases, such as cholera, Ebola, plague, yellow fever, dengue, we analyze those and we put several uh, parameters, uh, measure them against several parameters. And is this outbreak serious? Is it unusual? Is it unexpected? And is there a risk for international spread? If all these are met, 
then this is termed a public health event of international concern. And you'll remember that the current COVID-19 outbreak uh, was called a public health internet, uh, event of international concern quite early on. So we measure these. For COVID-19, it's serious, it's unusual, it's unexpected, and it certainly has uh, had international spread. So let's look at the outbreak of swine flu, the pandemic of swine flu in 2009, and see what lessons we can take uh, from this. It's important when we think about influenza and compare uh, COVID-19 to other respiratory pathogens to see that they're very basic differences between influenza and the coronavirus currently uh, causing COVID-19. So influenza viruses have eight genetic segments, one, two, three, et cetera, segments. They also, uh, so each of these segments is producing uh, material to have the antigens, which are very important. So influenza has two antigens by which it's both uh, defined and very much important in its causing disease, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase antigen. So we define influenza viruses by H and N1 and N types, and we develop vaccines to those. Influenza, when it reproduces itself, doesn't do it very carefully. It's been called sloppy, capricious, and promiscuous. So it shares genetic segments. It has multiple mutations when it multiplies. And that allows influenza to look different to us, the human population, every single season. So antigenic drift is a point mutation in one of these genetic segments. So it's a mutation in the H or N antigens, these two very important uh, surface antigens of the virus. And this leads to annual epidemics, so our annual flu season that begins late October, early November, and continues through uh, early March or so. Because this virus is shifting each year, we try and predict the next season's flu viruses, and we put those, make those in a vaccine, and we get our annual vaccination. So that's why we get an annual vaccine every year, because we expect that there'll be some shifts. That also allows these slight changes in the influenza virus to affect populations that don't have previous immunity to this particular virus, because it's a little bit different each year. So therefore, we get uh, large uh, numbers of people who are becoming ill because they haven't seen that particular virus uh, in the past. Occasionally, the virus can shift its entire um, genetic segment, so there's a reassortment of RNA segments, and that leads to pandemics. So you get an entire shift. One of these is exchanged with another virus to develop a third virus, which looks very, very different. And so in this case, the whole world has no immunity to this pathogen and becomes susceptible, leading to a pandemic. So the pandemic with swine influenza virus in 2009. So as happens with emerging infections, is somewhere in the world something happens, and it's detected because we have the ability to detect uh, these, uh, these emergence of the, of the pathogen. So this was swine influenza A infection in two children in Southern California, March and April of 2009. So this was unusual enough that it had a report in the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report, uh, the, the weekly uh, uh, journal of the CDC. And neither of these children had contacts with pigs. So if they had a swine flu virus, we would expect that they had come in contact with pigs, but they, they hadn't. So the effort was uh, on to see where this emerged. And it was uh, seen that Mexico, at the same time, was having a, uh, an increase in the numbers of influenza respiratory cases. And these cases turned out to be uh, pandemic influenza, the swine flu. And from these first uh, cases, this uh, went throughout the, uh, the globe very rapidly through that international spread. And by the 11th of June, uh, a few weeks later, the World Health Organization determined that this was a pandemic. And what does a pandemic mean? A pandemic means that there's sustained human-to-human -human transmission of influenza A virus or another virus, like the virus for COVID-19, in at least one country of two or more regions of the world. 
So there are lessons that can be seen from this pandemic influenza. So I was in the United Kingdom uh, in a public health program uh, during this time and helped to uh, formulate the UK policy towards uh, containment, mitigation, and international travel policies. So this is the first 381 cases as of June of 2009 in the UK. So when you're first recognizing a new agent, you are trying to contain it. So what do we mean by containment? Well, we're applying classic public health measures to identify a case, to trace the contacts of that case, and then to treat and isolate them so that they are not going to pass it on to another individual. So early on in this epidemic, we can see, uh, if we look at the different colors here, the pink are imported cases, the yellow are secondary cases, so these are contacts of an imported case. The uh, light blue here, sky blue, is tertiary cases, so these are cases uh, which are a contact of a contact of a known case. And then we begin to get uh, sporadic cases. So early on, the cases are known. They're imported cases. And then we're able to identify the chain of transmission to the secondary contacts. And then we're able to follow this chain of transmission to the tertiary contacts. But over time, so if this is the 16th of April, and here we have uh, a month later, or, or a few weeks later, the 2nd of May, we're beginning to get cases that pop up that don't have any clear link to an imported case, a secondary case, or a tertiary case. And by the time we've gone uh, uh, more than a month, we're seeing some cases which have no clear uh, mode of transmission. So you were getting community spread. So you try very hard to follow these initial cases, to identify the case, to uh, trace the contacts, to treat and isolate them, but eventually those methods are no longer uh, uh, possible to do to contain the spread. You can slow the spread, you can perhaps blunt the curve, but you're not generally able to stop it. So by the time we get to July and we look at the, the first 4,147 cases, we move into the area of mitigation. So all the cases at this point are indigenous. We can no longer trace them. We don't have the public health resources to trace every case uh, at, at this point. And so what we're doing is we're trying to mitigate this uh, pandemic. And by mitigation, we mean limiting its effects on the morbidity, so the adverse consequences and the mortality, i.e. a death, and the burden on the health system. So we want to allow the health system to be able to take care of the many who are ill and to prevent economic and social disruption. We're seeing how COVID-19 is having huge uh, disruption of both uh, our economies and our normal social uh, patterns. So let's move now into the coronaviruses. The coronaviruses are uh, a family of coronaviridae, includes SARS, uh, MERS, SARS coronavirus uh, 2, which is the agent for COVID-19, and other uh, coronaviruses. These are enveloped, they are single-stranded, they are RNA viruses, they have a large genome, so a lot of genetic material, and they have these spike proteins, which are very important in their ability to bind to our respiratory epithelial uh, receptors. So the virus that has come now into our human populations has adapted so that it can attach to our uh, epithelial receptors very efficiently. And for SARS and COVID-19, the receptor is the angiotensin-converting enzyme 2. Their probable origin is in bats with transmission to intermediate hosts and then into the human population following that zoonotic uh, trail. So here's an electron micrograph of uh, coronavirus inside uh, a respiratory epithelial cells. You can see multiple virus particles there. And then the clear pattern of this corona, this crown-like uh, uh, spike proteins on the surface of the virus, very important for the attachment. So coronaviruses are not unique 
uh, to human populations. They are one of the many viruses that people get uh, for the common cold. They can cause moderate, mild to moderate upper respiratory infections. There are four types of those. So they'll give you cough, coryza, which is kind of runny, stuffy noses, fever, headache, and malaise. And they can be more severe in young children. So these viruses, we know these viruses. They're part of the many viruses like adenovirus and rhinovirus that go through populations giving us the typical upper respiratory tract infections. But there are three of them that have the potential for severe respiratory illness. SARS, the causative agent of SARS in 2002 and 2003, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and then SARS coronavirus 2, the agent of COVID-19. So we know that uh, from SARS that that agent was transmitted through respiratory droplets, coughing. So every time I cough, I create a, a stream of, of particles, droplets. And if those get into another person's mouth, nose, or eyes, uh, that's going to transmit infection. You can get infection through close personal contact, so you're coming probably in contact with their secretions. If I'm coughing or into my hand and then I put my hand on the surface, uh, that can contaminate that surface with secretions. And then we also know that the SARS virus was passed in the stool and there's indications that the COVID-19 virus uh, is as well. So this makes it quite clear how do we avoid this illness? We'll come back to this, but we avoid getting other people's respiratory droplets, and we avoid getting potentially contaminated surfaces uh, on our hands and then uh, into our face. Those uh, droplets tend to fall down to the ground within around three to six feet. So that's when we talk about social distancing. That's why that uh, uh, distance has been uh, defined. So let's look at SARS, and SARS started likely in horseshoe bats. So that was the zoonotic infection, and then they passed into an amplifying host, which may have been civet cats uh, sold in wet markets in China, so uh, in Guangdong province uh, in southern China. You can see a wet market. These are the typical markets uh, where you have lots of live animals, uh, lots of meat and intestines and body fluids that are all in one space. So it's a very efficient way to have exposure to these uh, pathogens. And that's uh, what's happened with COVID-19 in a wet market in Wuhan. So you have the zoonotic infection in the bats passing through the intermediate host, adapting to then pass into the human host. And if we come back to the challenge of international travel, we can see how efficiently we can spread this around the globe. So we take patient A, who came from Guangdong province, and went to a hotel, the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong. And this person infected multiple other individuals there. So these uh, went to Canada. This individual went to Ireland. This came to the United States. These people went to Singapore, infected another. Uh, individual who went to Germany, uh, this went to Vietnam, and then lots of transmission in the healthcare setting within Hong Kong. So a single individual who is an efficient uh, transmitter of a virus can infect others and then they are going uh, to pass it on throughout the globe, so efficient spread around the globe. Now we'll see that SARS had a very different epidemic curve than to what we're seeing now. Uh, we had these initial outbreaks, and then this is, reflects the spread around the globe. Only 8,422 cases. We're now over 200,000 cases uh, for COVID-19. 29 countries, 916 deaths with an 11% case fatality rate. So when we saw this 11% case fatality rate and now a new coronavirus, we're certainly very concerned about the severity of this uh, new virus uh, when it first appeared. Why this was a much uh, shorter and uh, lower peak, we'll come back to a little bit later in our comparisons with COVID-19. For the United States, uh, there really wasn't uh, much 
impact in terms of the health system. There was certainly a lot of concern expressed, but uh, there were only 164 cases and suspect cases and no fatalities. And so the first few cases began in mid-February, and by the end of March, so about a month and a half or so, this had pretty much passed through the United States. If we look at the other one that can cause uh, severe respiratory illness, that's Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS. Um, probably bats are the zoonotic host, and then the intermediate host is camels. Most of these cases, 80% of these cases, have occurred in Saudi Arabia to date, uh, and there still are a small number of cases that are uh, continuing to occur. 2,500 cases, 27 countries, 861 deaths. So SARS has a case fatality rate of 11%. MERS has a case fatality rate of 34%. So again, one can understand the heightened concern about uh, COVID-19. So let's look at COVID-19 uh, and consider again the movement of a zoonosis into humans. In this case, uh, going from bats perhaps to an armadillo-like uh, intermediate host called a pangolin. A pangolin's meat and its scales are very much valued. It's not entirely sure that this is the intermediate host, uh, so that's still open to debate. And then passing in this wet market environment to the humans. So the epidemic curve in China is very illustrative, I think, and ha has lessons for, for us here in the United States. So first cases de uh, detected in, uh, in late December of 2019, and then a rapid spread uh, throughout most provinces of China, beginning in early January, peaking at the end of January, and then tailing off through February, such that uh, today in China, uh, there are just uh, less than 50 cases, and most of those have been linked to known, known cases. So, an epidemic curve that lasted, let's say, from uh, early January through late February, around two months. And all these are the types of interventions that China did. This virus occurred during the Chinese New Year, a time that people are traveling throughout uh, China. Much concern about spreading it throughout the rest of China, so the epicenter here in Hubei province in Wuhan, and then spreading throughout uh, China uh, this is December 31st, and this is the 11th of February, over this period of about a month and a half. And as of yesterday, uh, there were 81,111 cases. So if you think of China having 1. let's say 3 billion people, uh, this could have been 810,000, it could have been 8,111,000 individuals, but it wasn't. So how did China deal with this in terms of uh, preventing the widespread uh, uh, consequences of this, they instituted very strict measures, strict uh, measures that perhaps uh, other countries that, are, um, that aren't used to perhaps uh, more top-down approaches to civil liberties might not uh, appreciate, but they were effective for China. So strict measures, which included case identification and contact tracing, so they were able to do that because they scaled up testing very quickly. And they developed a syndromic approach to identifying cases and then isolating those and tracing their contacts. They used very strict measures around isolation and quarantine. So isolation is generally voluntary, quarantine is more involuntary. Uh, strong uh, recommendations around social distancing and restriction of travel, shutting down subways, uh, trains, airplanes to and from the province. They were able to do a lot of this because they had availability of testing, and that's something that has been a failing of the United States in terms of uh, widespread availability of testing. And they had rapid scale up of their facilities. They were able to build hospitals within days um, and improvise. We may have to improvise depending on how many individuals are infected in terms of where we take care of patients but they used all sorts of uh, options to uh, uh, isolate and, and take care of their patients. So we can get a better view of, uh, or, or a clear view of the spread of this by going to two sites. One is the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center, uh, 
uh, which gives you the case numbers, and then the other, uh, the US uh, cases uh, by the New York Times. So I'm just going to close out of this and then open up um, my web browser and show you the Johns Hopkins uh, site here. So this has a, a very dynamic uh, portrayal of the cases around the globe. And it gives you basically in real time. So China uh, still has the most, but Italy really is the epicenter of uh, COVID-19 now. And let's move over to here. It gives you the cumulative cases uh, over time. And if we eliminate other locations and the recovered, we can see for China a very rapid increase over February and then really leveling off to very few cases. If we look at other locations now and we remove uh, China, we can see that we are in the exponential period of, of these cases, so a huge rise. So we haven't done what China did. We're still in the growth phase of this epidemic uh, and all the consequences that it may have. If we go to the New York Times site, uh, we can see a, a real-time map of where the cases are in the U.S. Um, it used to be that it was just uh, kind of bi-coastal, uh, the Pacific Northwest here in Washington, California, and the Northeast, but now every state of the United States has cases. So these are uh, good ways to follow the case, uh, uh, case con counts. So what about the signs and symptoms? This is uh, a series of uh, 1,100 patients uh, from China. These are hospitalized patients. So this is the tip of the iceberg in terms of severity. This is not looking at all the individuals who have COVID-19. This is looking at those who have the most severe illness. So we can see that fever occurs in about 44% on admission and almost all patients once they're in there. Uh, cough is common. It's not typically bringing up a lot of phlegm or sputum, so it's a drier cough. Shortness of breath, 19% uh, on presentation, fatigue, diffuse uh, muscle aches and pains. So most individuals had an abnormal chest x-ray. Many individuals, almost a quarter of individuals, had comorbid conditions, so they had other illnesses affecting uh, their health. And the case fatality rate in this uh, series was 1.4%. Okay, so. 14 out of every 1,000 individuals uh, died from this. But CDC gives a range uh, here in terms of the typical symptoms. So when we're trying to look at this disease on a public health measure, we have to come up with some typical symptoms. And so the CDC and others have come up with fever, cough, and shortness of breath as being the typical syndrome, symptoms of COVID-19 illness. That is in distinction to what might be the symptoms uh, of a common cold. So the common cold typically has sneezing, stuffy nose, and sore throat, where those are uncommon with COVID-19. Again, fever, cough, and shortness of breath. You're not going to get shortness of breath with a common cold. However, as we ramp up, scale up testing, we, I'm sure, are going to find that there's a much wider spectrum of clinical illness than that seen in just hospitalized patients. If we look down uh, a little more carefully at who is being hospitalized, so this is the consequences of this illness. This is 45,000 cases, and this is in Wuhan, Hubei, and uh, the rest of, of China. We can see that 90% or so are between the ages of 30 and 79, and that's pretty much the same whether you're looking at Wuhan, Hubei, or in other areas of China. So we're not seeing hospitalization in the younger, 0 to 9, or 10 to 19. They tend to have less severe illness because they're not being hospitalized. But even young, healthy people, there's a high rate of hospitalization. So they're accounting for 13% from 30 to 39. But we'll see that they're not having the severe consequences of this. They're not dying from this. And yesterday, the CDC published uh, uh, their uh, 
um, analysis of age and hospitalization in the United States, and it's the exact same type of data that younger people, uh, um, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, are being hospitalized at a reasonably high rate or, or high percentage of all hospitalizations, but they're not developing the severe consequences. So this is a risk, um, particularly for basically all age groups, maybe not uh, so much then for the uh, young children and adolescents. So if we hone down on this same cohort of patients and look at deaths, we can see that the case fatality rate here increases the older you get. So the case fatality rate, even though 30 to 39 are being hospitalized, the case fatality rate is 0.2%. Whereas if you get over 80, it's up to 15%. So that helps us understand that this is, uh, uh, has high consequences for uh, those who are older. And most of the deaths, 81% of the deaths occurred in those age 60 to over 80. So the admonitions for older individuals to be particularly careful in prevention. So illness severity overall, about 80% was mild, 50% severe, and 5% critical. And it, severity increased with comorbidities, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, chronic respiratory illness, and cancer, so other hosts that should be particularly careful. If we hone down on specific risk factors for fatalities, this in a study of 191 hospitalized patients in China, 137 survived, 54 died. Older age, for every year older you are, there's a 1.1 increased risk of dying. So uh, just showing the, uh, that the data on death uh, is, is accurate in terms of your risk for dying. If you're female, you have a, a lower risk of dying from this, so it's 0.6 compared to something greater than one. Smoking, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, coronary heart disease, 21 times increase for coronary heart disease. SOFA score, sequential organ failure assessment, so the more uh, uh, challenge you have when you're in the hospital, so respiratory failure, cardiac, uh, digestive failure, uh, renal failure, the higher the likelihood that you will die. And if you're diabetic, it's almost three times higher risk. So again, it helps us give advice to those who will be at higher risk from the consequences of this. The median duration of viral shedding in survivors is 20 days. So that's why if you recover from this, you should be continued to be checked for virus until you are negative. What does this look like? We're not going to go through the pathophysiology but this looks like a very severe pneumonia. So this, the lungs should be black here. They're not, they're filled with fluid and the virus is getting into the uh, alveoli, into the lung uh, uh, substance and it's causing inflammation. And then the host immune response is going in there to try and take care of those viruses and in the process is filling up our lungs with inflammatory fluid leading to respiratory failure. And here's the electron micrographs. You can see the ciliated respiratory epithelium and lots of virus particles uh, multiplying in that respiratory epithelium. So how infectious is this virus? It's, again, help us when we're trying to think about uh, preventive uh, measures here. We can apply the RO, the reproduction ratio. The RO means the number of new cases one individual with the disease generates on average over the course of its reproductive uh, period, and it's a measure of inherent transmissibility. So the higher the RO, the more infectious the disease. So if the RO is less than one, that means if I have infected with flu or COVID-19, I'm going to infect less than one other person. So that means that the disease will no longer propagate. So our goal with any respiratory pandemic is to bring the RO for the population less than one. ROs that are high mean it's the more efficient transmission of the disease. So if we look at that in comparison of other diseases, we see that measles is really the most infectious of the respiratory diseases. The RO here is a whopping 12 to 18. So a single person is going to infect 12 to 18 other individuals. For seasonal influenza, it's 
So a little more than one person, and that allows it to uh, continue to propagate. For COVID-19, it appears to be somewhere between 2 and 2.5. So that is actually quite infectious. If you look at uh, the transmission of other agents, that's one of the highest. SARS was 2.2 to 3.6. But 2.0 to 2.5 means, on average, I'll infect two other people, who then will infect two other people, who then will infect two more people. So you go from 2 to 4 to 8 to 16. Um, um, to increase, increase the virus. They also have a, a wide range of case fatalities. Again, this is why we were so concerned if we had SARS of 11% and MERS of 35%. This is 1% to 3%, which is still uh, a quite high case fatality rate. Once we know the full spectrum of illness, I would expect that this will decline, but it's certainly not going to be declining for those in the high-risk uh, categories. So we've used influenza as a paradigm. How does COVID-19 compare the transmission dynamics of COVID-19 compare with those of influenza? Influenza has a shorter incubation period than COVID-19. Influenza is every three days. So that means you could get kind of doubling every three days, whereas with COVID-19, you could get doubling every five to six days. So it's a little, takes a little bit longer and maybe buys us a bit more time in terms of control measures. Pre-symptomatic transmission. So this gets to the issue of, is there, are there people who are asymptomatic, i.e. no respiratory symptoms whatsoever, and are they spreading infection? You have people spreading infection before they become clinically ill, so in the couple of days just before they uh, declare their illness. So for influenza, that's a major driver of the pandemics or the epidemics each year. With COVID-19, we think it's less frequent, but I'll come to some data around this uh, to try and highlight uh, what we mean by that. Children as drivers of influenza are important, less so in COVID-19, and it may be actually that adults are passing it on to the children. Reproductive ratios we've seen, influenza is around 1.2, and COVID-19 is 2 to 5. Severity in influenza is different than in COVID-19. Children in pregnancy, we don't know quite yet about pregnancy in COVID-19, but certainly children have a higher morbidity uh, associated with influenza than with COVID-19, in addition to the elderly and those with comorbid conditions. And we just need to remember, uh, putting this in perspective, that each year influenza causes 9 to 45 million cases leads to 4.3 to 21 million medical visits, 140 to 810,000 uh, uh, case hospitalizations, and 12 to 61,000 deaths. So that's with a uh, case fatality rate of 0.1 to 0.3 percent. So if COVID-19 were to spread as widely as influenza in the population, we could be looking at uh, 120,000 to 610,000 deaths, which would clearly overwhelm our medical system. So our goal is clearly not to have that kind of morbidity and mortality and uh, implications on our uh, health system. So let's come back to this issue of asymptomatic transmission, i.e. transmitting virus when you're well, no symptoms, pre-symptomatic, i.e. in the couple of days before you become ill, and then undocumented. So I like undocumented infection transmission. This is uh, something that was talked about in an article in, in Science uh, a few days ago, which I will, I'll show you the information on. This means that the spectrum of illness may not just be fever, cough, and shortness of breath. It may be other symptoms that are mild um, in other individuals who are transmitting infection. It doesn't mean that they're asymptomatic, but it means that they don't have the uh, typical symptoms that are leading to hospitalization. So if we look at the isolation of the SARS virus, the virus that caused SARS in 2002, 2003, we can see that uh, human specimens, a nasopharyngeal specimens or stool specimens, and then the days from illness, so the highest isolation percentage times was from days 6 to 14 of illness, so that the highest virus excretion occurred a week into your illness, not on day one, not before day one, but at a week into illness, okay? So because there probably was not much asymptomatic or undocumented transmission of infection that really allowed that curve as soon as you put in control measures 
to be shorter. So we had much fewer cases, wasn't able to propagate because most people who were shedding the most virus weren't out there in the community, they were in the hospital settings. So that led to um, uh, outbreaks in hospitals. Remember in Toronto, uh, many cases related to hospitalization. So SARS had a very different uh, pattern of transmission. The sickest people uh, in their, later in their illness were transmitting the most virus, but they weren't in the community transmitting it. So it allowed a shorter duration and a, a shorter peak curve. If we look at virus transmission in COVID-19, just a, a small study, 17 patients uh, in China, but we see that the highest transmission is early on, days since the onset of, of symptoms, so the highest transmission here, and then declining. So in a week, uh, actually in the, in the hospital, the virus titers are getting lower uh, as the illness becomes more severe. So that does mean that individuals early on in infection uh, are able to uh, transmit infection. So I mentioned the science study which looked at uh, undocumented infection in China. I like this term undocumented versus asymptomatic. Undocumented might include asymptomatic, but it also would include people who don't have that classic fever, cough, and shortness of breath. So early on in the pandemic in China, 86% of infections were undocumented. Transmission potential from undocumented infections was 55% of the transmission from documented infections. So these undocumented infections were transmitting virus, but they were not transmitting a virus as efficiently as those who had documented infections. However, because of their high numbers, they were infection source for 76% of the documented infections. As the pandemic progressed, an increasing percent of cases were documented. So, this is a mathematical model, mathematic prediction, looking at uh, lots of uh, epidemiologic data. So I think this does say that in the community, there are individuals who have, might have mild illness, which is COVID-19, and they're capable of transmitting infection, but they're not as capable of transmitting it efficiently as uh, people with full-blown illness. We're certainly seeing within the United States because of uh, community transmission. There are individuals throughout uh, the United States who didn't have any known uh, uh, link to a, a case. And so this is perhaps a situation where we're in now in the U.S. So what do we need to do? We need to uh, ramp up, scale up our testing so we know the full spectrum of illness. We can answer this question about pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic, and undocumented infection uh, and really bring some clarity to that. We need uh, widespread testing. So let's look at then the control measures here. Um, early on we talked about this for containment. Containment is when you're trying to contain this and not let it spread widely. Classic pub health, public health measures of case identification, contact tracing, treatment, isolation, or quarantine. And then we get a little bit from containment to mitigation. Uh, uh, here is personal hygiene. You can all practice that. So if you are distancing yourself from an individual who has this and you are not uh, touching surfaces that are contaminated and you're washing your hands and not touching your face, you're going to prevent this illness. So social distancing for communities, for individuals, restrictions on math, mass gatherings, canceling public events, uh, closing school and other uh, types of uh, gatherings, working from home, reducing travel, Self-isolation is voluntary, quarantine is more restrictive. So these are the kinds of things we can do. And then once we get to mitigation, where we are now is trying to limit the consequences of this. We're less likely to do aggressive case finding and contact tracing. We need to assure there's sufficient capacity to provide for all ill persons. So if we're gonna mitigate this outbreak, we have to be able to do this. Um, we have to be able to find capacity for all ill persons and persons not just with COVID-19, but with cardiac failure or other types of pneumonia or uh, uh, needed surgical procedures. And we need to try and maintain commerce and essential activities to keep our society functioning. A big challenge when there is so much uh, shutdown. So our goal is to flatten the curve. You've heard this term applied uh, frequently. This is what happens without uh, protective measures. So we have this high peak which may get above the health system capacity to control disease, 
but if we can apply protective measures here, we may prolong the epidemic, the pandemic, but we're allowing our health system to uh, take care of those who are ill. And we really don't want a situation, this is an intensive care unit in China, where it's just completely overwhelmed. Do we have enough, enough intensive care beds? Do we have enough respirators? Do we have enough health care personnel uh, to take care of these patients as well as uh, patients with other diseases? So for the individual, we can do these. These are going to prevent you from getting uh, COVID-19. We can distance ourselves from those who are ill. We can cover our coughs, properly dispose of the tissues, and wash our hands. We cannot be putting our hands into our nose, eyes, or mouth. We can clean uh, surfaces. So on a shiny uh, metallic surface, uh, the virus may last uh, on Average, it could last six uh, to seven hours. So some are going to last shorter than that. Some might last longer. But having a regular uh, cleaning of those surfaces, you can use a fairly easy uh, formula of a third of a cup of bleach in a gallon of water. Staying home, so self-exhalation here. And again, washing, uh, washing your hands frequently. So vaccine, there's talk about that. There's already a trial in process. But we knew all the antigens for influenza. We knew how to produce the influenza vaccine. We knew about its basic safety, so we didn't have to worry so much about an unsafe vaccine when we put in the antigens for H1N1. And yet it still took us six months. So I got my vaccine uh, in the UK on the 3rd of December, and this was outbreak began in April. So it takes a while with a brand new virus. We don't know all the immunologic properties of it. Uh, it's going to take at least uh, a year to 18 months before we get that. In terms of therapy, we have a reasonably good agent for influenza, Tamiflu or also Tamivir, but we don't have that uh, uh, for COVID-19. There are lots of agents that are being trialed, but we don't know their efficacy. So finally, how long will this last and will it come back? Let's look at the pattern of influenza, the pandemic influenza. So this was the typical influenza uh, season in the United States. So we see it beginning in late November, December, peaking in March, and then fading down in April. And then all of a sudden, pandemic flu came in. So we saw many more cases. So rather than a peak of around 3 to 3,500, we had a peak of around uh, five to uh, 6,000 cases and other cases of influenza. So influenza tends not to like more humid weather, tends not to like uh, hotter weather, and so we have a normal decline here, but influenza certainly was uh, efficiently transmitted uh, during this uh, summer months. And then it declined, and then it came back that next season, so the typical influenza season was a little bit earlier that year, and it, it declined a little bit earlier as well, but most of the virus that year was here in orange as a pandemic flu. And now uh, the, the consequences of that were 61 million infections, so 20% of the U.S. population got sick, uh, 274 hospitalizations, and 12,469 deaths with a case fatality rate of 2 per 1,000. And this virus has now uh, persisted. But remember, this virus, the influenza virus, has the capacity to change its surface antigens a little bit every year, so it can die down in the summer months, but it can change and mutate and then appear again. Uh, this is this year's uh, flu season. We don't know, uh, perhaps we don't think that the coronavirus can do the same thing. So it's possible that if we can uh, lower this uh, transmission, we can be able to not see this virus uh, come back again. But we're still on this curve, this up curve here. This is uh, the case count from the New York Times. Looking at all the US cases, we're very much in this peak here. You can see slowly and rapid peak. So that's why we need to do these isolation measures. We need to uh, try and uh, put in mitigation efforts. And really, to lower the R1 reproductive ratio, the RO, to less than 1. And we'll do that through our mitigation efforts efforts, our uh, social distancing, our washing the hands, our staying home if we're ill. 
so we can really, I think, do this. And uh, there is a plan, uh, the administration's plan, along with the CDC, to really aggressively try and put these in places, place over these uh, uh, 15 days beginning March 16th. So let's see where we are in two weeks and see what that peak is doing. Is it still going up or is it declining? And perhaps if we can bring this RO less than one, uh, this virus may not appear again uh, because um, it doesn't have that capacity of, of the flu virus to keep changing. Depends how much uh, transmission there is at low levels. So we'll just have to see uh, how, how this plays out over the next uh, month or two. So I'd just like to finish now with uh, a couple of thoughts on, on this and, and again putting this in perspective. This was a statement by Ban Ki-moon in June in the middle of the pandemic of uh, swine influenza. And this is following the economic uh, uh, downturn of 2008. So at this time of global economic downturn, we face a crossroads. We can cut back on health expenditures, expenditures and incur massive losses in lives and capacity for growth. Or we can invest in health and spare both people and economies the high cost of inaction. The choice should be clear. So we need to continue to pursue science to be pandemic ready, to answer that question, are we ready, uh, that I posed at the beginning of this. We need to be ready to anticipate and to fund our science enterprise. And perhaps if there's a silver lining to this, a silver lining could be that our planet is being given a chance to recover a bit. So this is January um, of 2020. And this is February of 2020, and this is measurement of pollution. And we can see how China pollution, so the industrial output and the uh, transport uh, declined, and pollution uh, clearly declined. So hopefully our planet, and, and perhaps when we emerge from this, we'll find new ways of, of, of approaching how, how we carry out our daily life. And lastly, it's, it's the people that we need to think about, uh, like uh, uh, Li Wanliang, uh, who was a, a young uh, a Chinese doctor at the beginning of the epidemic who noticed that something was unusual happening and tried to call attention to that, face the consequences, and then actually lost his life uh, to COVID-19. So we need to clearly understand the implications of this on people. It's really about uh, putting our, our people first. And I will uh, close the last slide. Is a quote from uh, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, uh, the Director General of the WHO, who said last week, there's been so much attention on one word. That one word is pandemic. Let me get you, give you some other words that matter much more and are much more actionable. Prevention, preparedness, public health, political leadership, and most of all people, focusing on those who are most affected by the consequences of the pandemic. So thank you for your attention, and I'll end the session now. Thank you.